The same week this country laid George Floyd's body to rest. Lives like George will not matter until somebody pays the cost for taking their lives. Members of his family are speaking out. He didn't deserve to die over $20. Is that what a black man is worth, $20? The protest movement demanding change shows no signs of slowing down, and the people in power are starting to get the message. In Denver and Portland, police will no longer serve as security guards for public schools. In New York and Los Angeles, elected officials are pledging to reject donations from powerful police unions that often oppose major reforms. In Philadelphia and Atlanta, district attorneys are prosecuting police for violence against protesters. In Washington, D.C., congressional Democrats announced the Justice in Policing Act, which would ban chokeholds and no-knock warrants. We cannot settle for anything less than transformative structural change. And in Minneapolis, Minnesota, the city where George Floyd died, not only have all four officers involved in his death been arrested and charged, but the Minneapolis City Council announced its intentions to completely disband the police department in favor of community-based investment and alternative interventions. Our commitment is to end our city's toxic relationship with the Minneapolis Police Department. There's still a long way to go, and the protests show no signs of slowing down. But it's already remarkable how much the American conversation has changed in just two weeks. A recent ABC News Washington Post poll showed that 74% of Americans believe the death of George Floyd is a symptom of a larger systemic problem with police in this country. That's up from just 43% in 2014. And a Civics Daily tracking poll shows support for the Black Lives Matter movement spiking exponentially. So if there's one thing most Americans have in common, it's this. We are ready for change. The death of George Floyd sparked protests around the world, but many still see the United States as a global outlier when it comes to police violence. The number of people who die in police custody is six times higher in the United States than in the United Kingdom. And in 2018, nearly 1,000 Americans were fatally shot by police compared with just 11 people in Germany, six people in Sweden, and only one person in New Zealand, leaving many activists here wondering if police aren't always the right answer. Similar to a house that is built on a foundation that has irreconcilable structural issues. These reforms are sort of attempts to try to paint a room in a house that is fundamentally falling down. When we look at the case of Minneapolis, they implemented implicit bias training. They had community policing, procedural justice training. They did de-escalation training. They had mindfulness. They did reconciliation efforts with the local community and communities of color. They did all of these things. They implemented body cameras and George Floyd was still murdered. Those reforms, those interventions do not stop black people disproportionately from dying. The focus is now around defunding and people are hearing defunding and they're not seeing that it's a part of a broader strategy around diverting funds away from policing and reinvesting those into community resources. The safest communities don't have the most police, they have the most resources. And from decades of research, we know that creating communities that have the resources that they need to thrive, to have food, to have housing, to have employment and education. Those things drive down conflict, violence. Increased levels of policing actually causes violence. You know, some examples of that is if someone is having a mental health crisis, police respond to these situations and escalate them, you know, and especially if you have experiences with police violence, you know, what would it look like again if crisis intervention response teams were able to respond, if conflict resolution teams were able to respond to situations that didn't involve violence or harm. The only options really now are police. In the case of George Floyd, someone allegedly using a counterfeit $20 bill, and there was no reason why police had to respond to that. But the current model is someone committed a crime, call the police, the police come, and they often, as we see, engage in violence or arrest and it doesn't have to be that way. In many municipalities, the percent that the police take up of the budget is exorbitant. Any given municipality, it might be between 30 to 40 to 50 percent of the entire city budget. You know, what's to show for it? Really, what this all resides on is this very powerful narrative that police are the stewards of public safety. And so, if you were to say, you know, we think that we could, we should divert this money to schools and housing instead of police, it was almost seen, seen as a form of blasphemy because then it got interpreted as, well, that means you don't want safe communities. 
But there are other ways and other alternatives that we can approach a model of safety and that does not rely on, you know, centuries old models of, you know, really racial and class order maintenance. We know policing quite literally began as slave patrols. And then throughout the country, it was a way of busting unions, controlling and, and surveilling immigrants and, you know, black people and other marginalized communities of color in recent decades, every single social issue that you can take, basically, you know, government has said, let's try to police and arrest our way out of it. And that has not gotten us any closer to safety. In many ways, it's pushed us much further away from safety. You cannot truly address a foundation of a house that is structurally unsound and has irreconcilable issues by painting rooms. Right now, what's happening is that people are saying, well, if there's no police, what will happen to me? And this is why I think the focus again is on creating alternatives as much as it is about divesting and defunding from what currently exists. You know, we live in a very innovative country. And so, you know, a part of it is to say, well, what does it look like to begin to research what are the programs out there? You're looking what resources exist, what, what alternatives exist, how do we find and, and develop those? And then also what might we have to create to really be able to conceive of a blueprint that can keep everyone safe? Because this model at, at you know as it exists is not doing that. And, and not only is it not just keeping people safe, it's actually causing violence and harm and premature death routinely. Faith leaders are often at the forefront of civil rights movements, and this is no exception. The death of George Floyd caused many people of faith to say enough is enough. Across the nation, people of faith are bringing their voices together and the power of prayer to the protests. But on a rainy day in Houston, Texas, on the basketball courts where George Floyd used to play, something truly spectacular happened. We ask for forgiveness from our black brothers and sisters for years and years of racism, of systematic racism, of bigotry, of hate. And I just ask that y'all would forgive us, forgive us for our sins. I mean, it was just extraordinary to hear the type of repentance saying, hey, we know we have racism in our hearts. And it was this moment of extraordinary recognition. Yeah, I mean, there was almost not a dry eye on the basketball court. George Floyd has a reputation in Third Ward as being an evangelical, uh, heavily involved in, in at-risk youth programs, and everyone who knew him said to know him was to love him. The love was very strong. Whites, blacks, praying for God to heal us and heal our nation and unite us racially. It was just an, an amazingly powerful, powerful event that day. Bobby Herring, a, a white gentleman who you also saw praying, said, hey, I want all the white people to if you're in agreement with me, I feel like we should repent to the black community, even though we didn't do anything personally. I feel like we should repent to the black community for years of generational racism. And so would you guys take a knee with me and pray? We were so moved by that, we decided to take a knee and we said, yes, not only do we receive your apology, but we also want to repent for some of the ills in the black community as well. Healing is the answer. And if it takes us apologizing, even for something that maybe we didn't personally do, but that we're willing to take ownership for that has happened, whether it's in the black community or the white community. I think that's what God wants. And I think those are the steps forward for our nation to heal. And I think we need protest, but we also need the pray test. And that is those who believe in the power of prayer to unite, call on God, our creator, and ask for divine intervention. I also spoke with Bishop Marianne Buddy of Washington, D.C., who oversees St. John's Church across the street from the White House. She has stood with the activists defending civil rights after her neighbor, President Trump, took controversial photographs in front of the historic church. As a church leader and, and, and on a personal level, why is it that you, you found the need to, to show your support for these protesters and these activists? 
Well, shame on us if we didn't show up, right? Shame on us if we didn't um, join our voices with everyone else who was were horrified at the visual images of George Floyd being killed. The Bible calls us to love love God and love our neighbors as ourselves, to create just community, beloved community. Uh, the prophets say things like, let justice roll down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. Care for our neighbor and to love the stranger and to honor the God image in every other human being. There's frankly no other place I'd rather be if there's an opportunity to push an issue forward for greater justice in the society. With all that's going on with the protests, it's easy to forget that we're in the middle of a healthcare emergency. And some of those workers who've been fighting COVID-19 in hospitals around the country are now standing with protesters to fight for a more just healthcare system. For me, white coats for black lives meant that people in the medical profession, specifically physicians and medical students, they understand that black people are disproportionately affected by COVID, which we've clearly seen over the past few months. Like black women, we die during childbirth more than anyone else, no matter what kind of insurance you have, what kind of lifestyle you live. So I feel like White Coats for Black Lives kind of made the whole healthcare community take a step back and see their role in systematic racism. Black patients die um, disproportionately higher at the hands of medical professionals, um, whether that be because of like long-term care or lack of long-term care and prevention or just like in emergent situations. But I think that was very eye-opening for a lot of med students because a lot of medical students do come um, from a background of financial privilege. And so I think it was good for them to see that, especially because Fort Worth is not very diverse. You know, I love being in education because the passion of the of the young people that want a different world. I am very tired um, of myself. It's because I would love to say that I fixed it for that generation. I'm mad because we haven't. I'm tired that we have to keep having these same conversations. And this opportunity is just so unique. And I'll tell you, I'm encouraged because this is something that we haven't seen before. In order to fix these issues, um, we have to learn about why they exist in the first place. And we have to come to an understanding that we all have implicit biases. It's not just white people. It's not just people who have um, education. Everybody has implicit biases and they don't just go away, but we have to be made aware of them in order to not act on them. It's validating in a way, right? To tell them like this healthcare community knows that it is working against you, like the system is not here for you, but we would like to work for you, right? So we are your doctors, we're supposed to be taking care of you, we're your PTs, your pharmacists, and we're not gonna stand for this. We're here for equality for all of our patients. Hundreds of thousands of people around the globe have taken to the streets to protest the death of George Floyd. And it's not all just marching and carrying signs and confronting police. Here are some creative ways that people are spreading their message and showing their support. We're starting in the West, where thousands of protesters busted out the Cupid Shuffle in the streets of Oakland, California. Here in New York, the marchers were also making some moves. Halfway around the world, these Maori friends performed an impromptu haka honoring George Floyd at a Black Lives Matter protest in New Zealand. Even off the beaches of Santa Monica, surfers gathered to form a protest on the waves and showed their solidarity by raising paddles high in the air. Also in California, these traditional Aztec dancers performed to show their signs of support. while protesters in Texas cheered on this proud cowboy riding toward the state capitol. Finally, we head to Australia, where this aviator spread the message by skywriting the letters BLM for Black Lives Matter for all to see below. Those are just a few extraordinary signs of protest from around the world. Coming up, the world of sports is saying enough is enough. It, it may be furious and maybe outraged, 
And later, there was a you know peaceful protest planned, including the area our ceremony was supposed to take place. The last two weeks of protests have already spurred changes in major U.S. institutions, and sports is no exception. Athletes from the NBA, the USTA, and the UFC have all been vocal in their support for the cause. Even NASCAR is stepping up, with prominent drivers collaborating on a video in support of ending racism. Perhaps most notably, NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell reversed his stance on kneeling during the national anthem, admitting the league was wrong for not listening to NFL players protesting police brutality and racism. And solidarity doesn't end with pro sports. Change might be coming to your local CrossFit gym. CrossFit is a trademarked high-intensity workout with affiliated gyms around the country. But when its leadership failed to speak out on behalf of George Floyd, its close-knit community of fitness enthusiasts pushed back. CrossFit is very vocal on honoring heroes, honoring military, honoring the police. Like, you know, honor this, honor that. But it's such a controversy for them to, to step up and say, like, yo, no, we we stand against racism. Like, what, what's the what's the big deal with that? Like, I, I don't I don't get it. it. It made me furious and made me outraged. And when CrossFit founder Greg Glassman finally spoke, he tweeted Floyd 19 and ignited a controversy. It was really disheartening and discouraging, especially for someone like me who has been kind of back in CrossFit for a long time. I mean, that's your first comment about the situation. That's. That's unacceptable. Gym owners across the nation started denouncing their affiliation with the brand. We're not worried about dropping the CrossFit tag. What really makes our community is literally the community, the people in it. I kind of wanted to set the example that just because it's, it's possible we could take a financial hit, that's not going to stop us from being who we are. Athletes like six-time CrossFit Games participant Noah Olson said, I'm out. I made that statement that I was going to sit out essentially boycott this year's CrossFit Games contingent upon there being changes made within the organization that the community as a whole would feel good about and be able to celebrate. And fitness coaches also called for some action to be taken. The people in my community, the people in my CrossFit community believe that we need to voice and we need to stand up and say like, yo, we are against racism and we are against all these uh, discriminations and social injustices. But without us, without the people, the coaches, there is no community, there is no CrossFit. Following the backlash, CrossFit's founder George Glassman announced he was stepping down as CEO, though some still want him to divest his shares in the company. Many local gyms now look forward to building a new positive message on their own. You just want to set the tone, like be who you are, talk about what you believe in, and kind of like just have the back of the people you care about. After the break, should we be doing more to learn from the past? President Obama, in the wake of the shooting of Michael Brown, appointed a task force to look at how to build bridges between law enforcement and communities. Police misconduct is hardly a new issue, and in the wake of Michael Brown's death in 2014, the Obama administration created a task force to try to address and reform policing. What happened? We talked to a member of Obama's administration task force to find out. President Obama, in the wake of the Ferguson a shooting of Michael Brown in 2014, appointed me and then a Philadelphia Police Commissioner Chuck Ramsey to co-chair a task force to look at how to build bridges between law enforcement and communities to build trust. And that task force consisted of law enforcement leaders, civil rights leaders, so it was a very diverse group. We held uh, listening sessions around the country, we were able to come to consensus on 59 recommendations. The report really was based on the notion that police need to be guardians of the community rather than in a warrior stance all the time, treating our citizens fairly and impartially. Police officers need to be consulting with the community about what they see as issues about public safety. I've dealt with police leaders across the nation, and I think many of them have seen that they are charged all the time with dealing with problems of homelessness, mentally ill, substance abuse, 
when other services in the community have been cut back. Federal leadership is important, and from the federal government, some incentive funding, research, technical assistance, and support for training can be helpful. I thought the president's initial response, particularly in Lafayette Square, was appalling and inappropriate. I would suggest that he read our task force report. These are approaches that have worked in communities and that have helped advance public safety and advance law and order. Coming up. That energy and love that we received from all of them was just great. This is unreal. Unreal. That picture of the two of you on your wedding day, there walking with protesters, so in love. It was this moment of light in what's been a tough time. Why did you decide to celebrate then? So this was supposed to be a very, very, very private event. And obviously, we had to wake up early that morning. We had lots of things to go do. Carrie was getting ready, getting her hair, nails done. The city was blocked off a large swath of the center city area due to knowing that there was a you know peaceful protest planned, including the area our ceremony was supposed to take place. And I can just see what just turned into a steady stream of people coming up the street. We're lined up, you know, family, loved ones. Only thing we're missing is Carrie Ann. So Carrie Ann is standing around the corner. The protesters see her and they're like, wow, look, there's a beautiful bride here. So the people walking down the street came to a stop and just coalesced around Carrie. I'm around the corner. All I hear is clapping, cheers, run over there, run up the steps, run around the corner. I just see that energy and love, you know, the amazing comments from people saying how inspired they are. Uh, like I said, we're just truly, you know, humbled and, you know, we just can't wrap our minds around it. Yeah. Movement of people just marching for equality, and there was nothing to talk about but the peace, love, and unity. That's the biggest thing I take from that. Thanks so much for watching our show today, and as the sun goes down here at this vigil, people are still going to be marching and fighting for change in the days and months ahead. Thank you for being here with us. Thank you.